morning, and uh, I get to uh, open the meeting today since uh, there are no planning uh, applications. So Councillor Shirton gets the morning off. And, uh, <coughs> with that, uh, any uh, any disclosures? Seeing none. We'll move into uh, motions of consent. <coughs> I need a mover a seconder that the following motions be approved, one being ENV0120 annual water quality reports, and two, the FPC0120 forest conservation bylaw minor exception with respect to 1610 Highway 3 East Moulton. Councillor Shirton, seconded. Councillor Delamani, comments. Councillor Corbett. Just if I may, with regard to the forest conservation bylaw, how are the fees to be utilized? The uh, fees for planting trees or? Removal of trees, yeah. Uh, through the chair, the funds will be put into a reforestation fund uh, that will be used for planting trees on available county lands. Thank you, and I guess the question is from all the community, when do you plan on starting to plant trees? Uh, through the chair, uh, we're working on a planting strategy for Haldeman County that we're looking at uh, completing this year. Um, so then hopefully within the, the next following year, we'll be able to start to implement uh, the stages of that plan. Thank you. John Sheridan. Uh, on the same matter, um, no question, but just uh, I think it's knowing the farming community and knowing um, the operation of farming equipment, uh, the clearing of these trees, it, it's been sort of problematic as far as being able to work the grounds in a, in a good, uh, timely manner. So it, it will make it easier with the removal of these trees, and, and thanks for your work in uh, looking at it and discovering what needs to happen to move forward. So uh, I guess I do agree with the, the recommendation. And on the water thing, the question I have, um, I know the water from Hamilton kind of feeds Caledonia and Cuga, but um, I guess it doesn't directly go into the home. So we do have uh, abilities to disinfect or chlorinate. So that's why I wasn't sure if, if someone could maybe guess, fresh me on how that works. Because I was just saying the assumption, at least directly to Caledonia, it might go right into their homes, but I guess it doesn't. No, that's correct. Through the mayor, the, the <clears throat> water is received at the Caledonia Reservoir Booster Station, which is uh, number six north there coming into town. We break point chlorinate. So Hamilton uses a chloram chloraminated system. We break point that, rechlorinate it, and then it's distributed out to Cuga and Caledonia as well. Okay. But the, the water that comes from Hamilton is potable, though, isn't it? Correct, yes. Yeah, it's yeah. not like it's raw treated, water that Dumble gets. No, it's treated potable water. It is treated, okay. It serves the customers coming into Caledonia. And so there is a few that have there direct... Are a few services. Yeah, okay. See, I was under the impression maybe there was a, quite a few that were directly from that main trunk, but that isn't the case. Uh, there are maybe a half dozen services from Haldybrook Road to the reservoir that are directly off of the Hamilton water okay. before it reaches the reservoir. And then from there, everything branches everything out. Everything branches off. And then Cuga. I, we have full control at that point as far as pressures and, and chlorination disinfection. Okay, Something thanks. Else. I know the number one, but I wasn't quite as sure about that one there. So. Oh, you got it. Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> Anything else? None? All in favor? That is carried unanimously. <clears throat> and uh, move over to Councillor Delamani, page 75. Thank you. The um, we're here this morning is in regards to the Black Settlers of Campfield documentary series request for support. <clears throat> There's a motion on page 75 of the agenda. Can I have a mover and seconder to get this on the floor? Councillor Corbett is moved, seconded by Councillor Patterson. Um, there's staff here. Uh, if there's any questions from members of the committee regarding the report or the motion. Straightforward. Okay, all those in favor of the motion. So I got a question. question. You have a question? Well, I yeah. Asked. <laughs> I, I guess the question, and, 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 I, and I'm, I'm, I agree with the support that's being recommended. Recommend. Um, 
the rationale from the, the request was five when we decided what the two. Is that the kind of more or less keep in line of what we normally do or what was, can you maybe just explain publicly with the rationale for why the request is different than the approved recommendation? Uh, through the mayor, um, I guess one of the things is this is uh, different than what we normally do. So we, we've taken a different approach. Uh, and really where, uh, I guess, the bulk of the guidance came from was the, um, uh, the project uh, that, that Council dealt with about a year, year and a half ago, which was the Haldeman Norfolk Regional Archaeology Project. Uh, so we, we attempted to more or less mirror um, the, the funding that was granted to that project uh, with, with this particular project. So, you, so it's a little bit different than the norm. Yeah, okay. Right, but it's kind of sort of consistent what we did be in the past. Through the mayor, that's degree. correct. Okay, thank you. Councillor Mike <clears throat> Yes, to speak for the motion, actually, uh, this particular type of uh, venture would also have extreme economic benefit to the county through uh, historical tourism. I know sitting on the Haldeman Heritage Board or Heritage Haldeman Board uh, Committee that um, they're doing a lot of work. Uh, people there are doing a lot of work in, in promoting this, this uh, Endeavor, as well as the the black settlement in Canfield, the cemetery that's in Canfield, uh, dedicated to uh, to the people that uh, came through on the Underground Railway. Um, I would also like to speak to the motion that uh, I would myself, with some vibrancy fund money, maybe top that up. I don't know what uh, we would do about that. As far as I know, we had to be cautious of what we do and don't uh, put, put money into, but I think the economic benefit to, uh, to the county would, uh, it's Black History Month, February, uh, the movie Harriet, uh, an abolitionist from the States where a lot of her relatives came across at uh, Queenston Lewiston and settled in the Canfield area, relatives buried in the cemetery. So it's, it's, um, it's a very, hot topic right now and I think the county could benefit immensely from making sure this project uh, gets done. Great. Um, given that, what I'm going to suggest is that um, since this motion is not going to be ratified till Monday, that staff and uh, the councillor get together and modify the motion so that uh, um, the quantum and the funding source and all that from the uh, the CVF is uh, incorporated into it. So uh, my sense is um, for today then um, just recognize that uh, there'll be an amendment to the motion on, on uh, council. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other comments on the report then or the intent on the well, motion, we, Mayor? Just, uh, <coughs> uh, Graham's here, I just wanna say congratulations, Graham. It's, uh, it's a wonderful opportunity and uh, it, um, it's a local company, uh, it's, 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 it's good news all the way around and, and if uh, we can certainly participate in supporting this, uh, I think you can see that it's all there. So, so kudos to you for bringing this together. Okay, Councilor Sheridan. Uh, just for clarity, so is it, am I hearing we're gonna approve this and there might be a potential amendment or we're gonna defer this? until Monday and then have it ratified Monday. Like We're going to approve better it. Better grab the two while we can. Yeah. We're going to approve it now and then, and then assuming council agrees, we're going to approve it and then amend them Monday, Monday night. Okay, that's fine. I just wanted to make sure I knew what I was voting okay. on here. <laughs> okay, so the motion's on the floor. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor is carried unanimously. I have no other business listed under Community Development Services, so I'll turn over to Councillor Corbett. Yes, uh, Councillor Delmani, I understand with regard to other business that you had, I had one to deal with uh, medicinal marijuana. Oh, I'm okay. Sorry, I and, forgot that was under my section. You know, we've experienced a problem of uh, medicinal marijuana grow ops in the residential area. Uh, and we had difficulty in dressing it. I know people are allowed uh, for plants for household, but when you get up uh, to 200 in a residential area, it is quite a problem. And I must say, we did attend uh, a session at the Roma, uh, and the speaker there was the CEO from Leming Leamington, 
They do have a bylaw, passed a bylaw, that uh, restricts medicinal marijuana grow ops to industrial and uh, agriculture areas. And I'd like to see us uh, take a look at that, review it, so we can adopt it. I know the mayor attended that, and I believe uh, Councillor John was there as well. Uh, we're not alone with this problem. It's across the province, and hopefully the, uh, we can get something through AMO that they're going to have to address that. But in the meantime, if we can look at Leamington's bylaw, see if it's something that we can adopt and re restrict uh, uh, medicinal grow ops from uh, coming to the uh, residential area. They should be in an industrial area or agriculture area <coughs> if they grow more than four plants. So I, I don't know how to tackle it, whether I need a, a, a notice of motion to have uh, staff review it or if you can take it. Okay, before here. we go to staff, there's, there's two other comments to be made. Mayor? Um, just that uh, I was at that meeting with you, and, and, uh, and I do feel the same as I think every municipality in terms of supporting removing these, uh, these grow ops, for a bat, lack of a better word, uh, that are happening within the, 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 the residential neighborhoods of our communities. But the one glaring item that did come out of that meeting and, and still continues to dog many of the uh, municipalities is the policing and the effectiveness of, of being able to enforce uh, this. And so while, you know, giving that, that perception that there may be a, a way to curtail it, uh, the, the argument has been that, uh, that the bylaw is being currently tested in the courts and, uh, and, and that... Uh, the cost to the municipality to support that bylaw becomes excessive in the sense that uh, it, 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 it's you know uh, very large on the on the taxpayers uh, uh, bill and so so I think it, should we? It's, it goes beyond just a planning uh, item and a bylaw it, it really has to come from the top down I think in, in ensuring that uh, that it's not uh, local planning that, that that's driving where where this type of grow up takes place. It's got to be more of a strategic uh, you know, policy from, from, from Ontario and even Ottawa. And so I think the message is, is that we have to continue to, to come together on, on that as municipalities. Uh, but I think all of us just simply passing the bylaw is not going to, to eradicate this issue. And it's only going to uh, give certainly some false perception to public but also it's going to put uh, significant costs on the municipality so so I do support it but I, I, I just wanted to make that very clear that I think we have to go one step further than that Councillor Corbin and ensure that you know we're, we're pushing Toby and the Paul in the province to uh, you know to look at the policy as, as it stands today because it's it, there is a hole in it <clears throat> Councillor Metcalf and then Councillor Corbin yeah I think <clears throat> what I got out of that meeting was Mr. Kane that spoke uh, regarding the uh, the grow ops that uh, even the Fed said uh, Mr. Kane had spoke that there were a lot of cracks in the system and <coughs> there's a website that people can call it's a federal website that they can get a hold of contact if there's an issue or a problem I don't know like I say the uh, the regulation or the uh, enforcement or the inspections that are coming down from the feds uh, whether these have even been looked at some of these places that uh, if there's a complaint, you can get a hold of the website. I don't know if they'll send somebody out to check on it and uh, and have a look. But there is there is a website that uh, people can contact. How much uh, enforcement or how much inspection is done out there, I don't know. I know that they were, you know the feds rushed the, the the legalization through and left the municipalities holding the bag for the uh, the fallout. So, but there is a website. Councilor Corbett. Yeah, thank you. I'm aware of what the mayor is saying. We pass the bylaws that we find difficulty in enforcing, but at least we've got it on the books that, that's there that we can rely on. And it could have come in handy with the issue that we had on my local street. Yeah, um, yeah maybe just, and I'm, and I'm not 
opposing the idea of the bylaw, but what that, that bylaw that Leamington, the, 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 the comment from the mayor was that it is being challenged in court. And so, so I, 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 I don't want to simply just say, let's pass a bylaw and find ourselves in court where it's being challenged and, and, God, and we're defending it. And so I think we need to go, we need to unite as, as, a, as a community, we need to unite as municipalities, but we need to go further than just the bylaw. I think it has to be driven by policy. And that's, that's where I hope, I'm hoping the results of this court case in Leamington is going to drive uh, the need for that policy that will answer that issue that you're having in Dunville. So I, I support it, I do want it to happen. I'm just, I, 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 we may be simply just looking to pass a bylaw, we may be premature of the court decision. I, I'm, I'm sounding more like you, Mike, so maybe I should just let you speak. <laughs> um, to, to, <laughs> I'm gonna take that as a compliment, Mr. Mayor, but. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, the, the last comment you made, Mr. Mayor, is is actually not surprising to me that it's it's in front of the courts because the uh, the advice that that we've received to date through our solicitor is that um, trying to manage these alternative producers, these uh, these situations where an individual has a prescription to grow, um, uh, is is really outside of the jurisdiction of municipal zoning. Uh, so it doesn't surprise me that that that's where it's landed. Um, uh, I think there, there, there's a number of things here. Um, there, there is the, the right that every individual has, uh, you, I, everyone in this room, to grow four plants. Um, uh, then there is the next step up, which is those individuals who have a prescription, uh, who obtain a license from Health Canada, they can grow X number of plants. The X being whatever it is that's been prescribed. And I think that's, that's the issue that, that Councillor Corbett is, uh, is referring to here. Um, and, and we've seen um, in some of the research we've done some outrageous numbers um, that are being prescribed to one individual. Um, more, uh, and I'm not an expert, but more than I would imagine one individual can consume uh, in a given period of time. So that's where we're seeing the issues and, and that's where, again, the advice we've received to date has suggested that um, municipal zoning cannot trump a license that's issued by the federal government, Health Canada, um, for an individual where it's health related. Um, so, um, so certainly, you know, where things have landed in Leamington, um, that sounds about right. Uh, what the outcome is going to be, you know, certainly we, we wait um, well, with, with interest. But, um, you know, certainly that, uh, that is what I would have expected the path to be given, um, given the advice we've received to date. Councillor Patterson. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, I think it's, I agree with everything that's been said. I think it's like a, a two-prong approach. It's not just a zoning issue, it's a provincial issue, but what I suggest if Councillor Corbett agrees that before we send planning staff off to do a whole bunch of work, um, your colleagues in Norfolk, I think, are going through the same thing. They, recently, they had a public meeting with probably over 300 to 400 people, which I unfortunately couldn't attend, so I would say touch base with them. They might be a little bit ahead of us and as far as homework, so you're not doing you know, a lot of unnecessary work. Councillor Corbett? If I may, as long as it's kept on our radar that we have a concern, it's existing in our community, our neighbors in court over. So, yeah, if there's something <coughs> beneficial coming out, of it, even our MP should be notified that we're having difficulty. I would hope that in at least Norfolk that uh, she knows about it. So staff will keep us up to date on what's happening with that Leamington? It's through the mayor, absolutely, and it is something that uh, comes up on, almost, almost on a monthly basis, so it absolutely is staying on our radar. Okay. Thank okay. you. Uh, move to page, uh, what is it, 82, it's the Oneida Ballpark <coughs> property. The motion is on uh, page 82 that it, it's access to our needs and there's a, a motion to authorize a sale. Could I have a mover for the motion? Tony, a seconder. John, a discussion on the motion? Go ahead, uh, Rob. Well, knowing where this is and being a ball player, it's too bad that this has come to uh, how it's landed, but I can understand we haven't really utilized it. No one stepped up in 10 years, so we can't keep maintaining it. Uh, my question is about reading the report. 
I see if they go to change the zoning, it may require uh, some challenges. Um, this being nine acres, I see you're allowed one uh, house on it. Are you allowed in this area, is there agriculture in the area that would allow a, a farm? Because I'm just thinking the demand for a small parcel like this of nine acres where you could have a small hobby farm would be in large demand. But by reading this, when I just see one dwelling, I don't know if it allows for a barn with a horse or five sheep or anything on it. Planning issue, do you want to comment on it? Through the mayor. Um, <clears throat> so uh, certainly uh, uh, given the, um, let me back it up a step. Uh, the designation within the official plan uh, on this property is agricultural. So if there was a, an appetite to uh, change the zoning from the rural institutional that applies today to an agricultural zone, the policy basis, the policy support would be there to do that. That would in turn lead to the type of setup that you're describing, Councillor, with, with a small, small farm of, of some descript. Okay, so in saying that, um, is that a big hurdle? Like, it might be worthwhile. I would maybe suggest we as Council change, I think there'd be more use in agricultural and it'll allow for that to take place before we market it because right now it doesn't allow that and it might scare somebody off not knowing what's involved. So if it isn't a big cost to the county, I may recommend that we do that, then market that in the next, well, how long, how long does that take to change, I guess? Uh, th through, the, uh, through the chair, uh, a zoning process roughly, typically takes roughly three to four months. Um, I guess as an alternative to going through that process, uh, some, should council direct uh, us to go down this path, what we could look at is, is simply changing um, uh, the zoning structure within the new county zoning bylaw. And then when we bring that forward, um, you know, within the, uh, the next number of months, uh, again, the <coughs> aim is before the summer recess, we would be able to tie it up through that process, as opposed to going through a site-specific application, doing all the individual uh, notices to surrounding landowners, et cetera. That may be... Um, um, that is a much simpler process, and it, it, it's you know maybe another month, two months, um, you know to uh, to work its way through. Okay, so. I guess the, my next question, because I know you can have a private club on there. So the building that's on there, is it is it uh, usable for a, like a club, or would someone see tear it down? Like, what's the highest and best use? I guess the realtor that we choose will give us that, but I'm thinking it's more either residential or a hobby farm, which would be the highest and best use. Through the, through the chair, so the, the building itself was in reasonable shape a few years ago, and it's it just sitting stagnant, so I mean, somebody's gonna have to go in and assess it, but uh, it could be, you know, rehabilitated. We did spend some money on it a number of years ago. Okay. That Dan and Tony, just to follow up, does that require further direction or? Um, relative to the suggestion of uh, Councillor Shurton, um, my sense is <clears throat> going through a process to pre-zone the property on the basis of what <clears throat> we think is highest and best use or what we think is going to be most acceptable is I mean this respectfully, a little bit speculative. We typically sell properties as is, where is, and as you noted, someone might pick it up for a use that's already allowed on the property, in which case we would have gone through that process um, for not. So my suggestion is before we go down that road, let's see what the demand for the property is and okay. um, if somebody wants to, you know, make some changes typically they would come in and talk to staff and they would have a very good sense of how easy or hard it would be so okay. um, I would wait and, and use that as a plan B satisfied with that uh, yeah I am okay with that but if that because there is different highest and best use I would suggest not just seeking one realtor's opinion in this location we maybe seek out two or three that work that area because I think you will have a difference in pricing based on what they feel the highest and best use is before we just don't go out and choose one realtor I get two or three opinions and uh, I'm all, all in favor of that because it might take 90 days to close anyway by then uh, or 
by the summer recess, it might be okay for the new official plan or the new zoning bylaw anyway. So it could work all right. Thank you, Dan. Um, yeah, the, the, this ballpark, uh, it's got a lot of sentimental value to me and a lot of people. I was fortunate to win first provincial championship on that park back in the early 70s and, and I got a uh, poker in the butt when I dropped a piece of garbage by Freddie Prince who <laughs> many of us know because I see Councillor Del Monte laugh because he's yeah. <laughs> Freddie and Johnny Metcalf as well. Um, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a nice piece of uh, um, park that was great that many of us grew up in but moving forward it's unfortunate that it's come to the state and I, my opinion is that, uh, and would like to see us explore, uh, kind of on what Councillor Shurton has said, is that we should explore all uses of that. There is other opinions out there. Um, uses, <coughs> and I think that we should uh, open that up to make it more marketable to some that uh, may come in. And because bottom line is, let's maximize our dollars for it. And uh, if we can increase the tax base, the commercial tax base especially, um, with keeping in mind we do have some residents that are directly adjacent to the south of the property, I, I think we need to have that discussion um, looking at it and, and get various opinions as to where we should move with this property. You're not understanding what the CAO is saying that do we want to mark it as is and let them come forward with a proposal, you're satisfied with that? I am. It, it just we should also, uh, yeah, to make sure that uh, those people that come forward that they know that we're willing to work with them to to move it to a different use. Thank you, Tony. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. As Dan was saying, there's a lot of history on this property, um, and I've had a number of people approach me over the last five, six years about you know reactivating the the ball diamond use but it just got to the point where not, none of them really had the wherewithal to to make it happen and and that was after conferring with staff and and looking at the logistics and the cost but what later on what i started hearing from people in my ward is either make it a park or sell it because the the looks of it is, is really unsightly um as far as the use, I mean, I'd be open to to a lot of different things, but you know, what's always in the back of my mind is you've got the Canadian Gypsum Company there, and you've got Contrans, which is a you know a fast and growing uh, a business, and you never know one of the, one of those two uh, businesses may decide that, that they they have a use for that property. Uh, yeah, who knows? Um, I think we have to look at everything, but. It, it, that area has is, is become a real industrial type area. It's not the same as what it used to be with, when Mr. Prince and other people were involved with it. So, and you're on a very busy highway. So we'll see what happens, but I'm in totally in favor of the sale. Thank you. Uh, David, do you want to come forward and tell us <coughs> about your attempts to market as a recreational park? My apologies. Good morning. Could you repeat the question? I missed the last half of Your attempts to see that it could be used as a recreational park. You've got no takers. There's nobody willing to take it on. Yes. The uh, Katrina Schmidt and her work years ago went through the various user groups and uh, proposed uh, uh, various different options. You want to raise options. that up for yourself? So. Can you not hear this? It takes a while to raise up, so I was trying to <laughs> avoid. <laughs> Loading dog. So yes, Katrina Schmitz and her division went through this process years ago, I believe, and discussed the options with various user groups and found no interest. Thank you. Any questions to David? Oh, not not to David. More of a question for staff, I guess. No questions to Dave. Thank no. you. Okay. Um, so I, I noticed if they're going to put a different entrance into this park, is it currently off of six or off of this concession three? I'm thinking. It's off a of third line. It's off the third line. Okay, so it's it's not on the busy highway. So, no. it, okay, because I know getting maybe an entrance off of six may be more challenging with the ministry. So if it's already off of concession three, it's probably easier to. Okay, that's what I wanted to double check to. I couldn't remember exactly. I got Phil. Yeah, uh, through the chair, just to add, it, so Katrina marketed it both to ball clubs and soccer clubs. So, um, uh, and there was some interest at different times but uh, nobody could really make a go of it right so um, and this was a number of years now and uh, uh, eventually we, we um, took care of it as a passive park and but that uh, created 
issues for us because our, our level of standard as a passive park, it doesn't look as good as some of our other parks. And for some of the people who um, developed the park, it was, uh, it was difficult for them to, to see it in that state as well. So um, it's, uh, it's, it's been looked at for a long time. I just wanted to pass that forward. Thank you, John, for a first time. Sure. Just, just a comment that I know that uh, my batting average dropped considerably when we played up there, so. Just a comment. <laughs> good, Dan. Follow up. I'm good. <laughs> Any further questions? The, the motion is on page 82. It's a public notice of proposed sale and by a representative to authorize the sale. Those in favor? Motion is carried unanimously. I have another issue which I would wish to bring up, and it's with regard to Ministry of Infrastructure. I recall last year in August at the AMO conference in Ottawa, along with a neighboring MPP, two mayors, and a chief, we spoke to representatives of the Ministry of Infrastructure about a joint project for a regional water system which would connect Nanticoke to Norfolk and Six Nations. This year at our Roma conference, I was excited in hearing from the Honorable Ernie Hardeman, Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs, that a number of projects, including 27 joint projects, had been approved. I assumed wrongly that our project was amongst them. On the final day of the conference, there was a joint meeting held at Queen's Park to review this project. I was dismayed to find out that our project was not even on the radar, especially when two municipalities and one First Nation band were present to bring portable water to those who were in need. I applaud our mayor for reaching out to our member, Tony, Toby Barrett, in efforts to further this cause. Perhaps the press should contact him to enlist his views as to why this is not being moved forward. I think it should be out in the public. Mm -hmm. We have a win, win, win situation that we can benefit. Mm -hmm. I believe both communities and the Six Nations Reserve should be contacting our MPP and the appropriate ministers to see why this uh, isn't going forward to the benefit of all. Uh, water is a uh, right of life, and we should be able to deliver it to others. And I, uh, your, your Worship, I wish you would comment on it because I uh, fully support your letter that you put out on it. Okay. Well, I. Glad you opened the door. <laughs> Walk right through. Um, I did get a response, as you know, and uh, the uh, I, I think that the frustration from uh, my end is that uh, we've provided uh, uh, Toby Barrett's office and their staff uh, on a variety of occasions, I think over the previous years, uh, the scope of this particular project in terms of the water line from Caledonia to Hagersville and uh, and you saw in the email that uh, they were asking for us to provide once again the information and scope of this project so I'll ask staff that, that, that they could follow up with uh, with that request but uh, um, that being said I, I, I know that uh, that they are aware uh, I've had the conversations face to face with uh, with, with Mr. Barrett uh, on this particular project and so there shouldn't come as a surprise that uh, that we had those meetings. It shouldn't come as a surprise that uh, that we are working with Norfolk and working with uh, Six Nations and and uh, and the urgency behind now the water coming into Port Dover and Norfolk uh, should be one at the top of the list uh, for for that uh, for Toby's office and and I know that the mayor of Norfolk shares the same concerns as as we do. Um, I, I will use this opportunity to, to speak on a couple other things that uh, are of similar concern. Uh, and this just kind of, I think, goes to show that the, the, 
the disconnect between the municipalities, Haldeman and Norfolk, and, and, and our provincial representative, and, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm frustrated by that in the sense that, uh, you know, we've been lobbying for, for the final phase of the bypass of, uh, from Caledonia to, to Mount Hope Airport, as well as we've been lobbying for uh, centerline uh, rumble strips. Uh, again, uh, our counterpart has been made aware of that, has known that for, for the past uh, uh, three years as we've been, been making that conversation. And I find it odd that, uh, you know, our, our MPP would post on his Facebook uh, asking for thoughts on whether it's time to consider completing the highway uh, from Highway 6 bypass to Mount Hope Airport and uh, whether we should have steel dividers along Highway 6 north of Caledonia looking for input. And, and I find that odd. Uh, and that comes off the Haldeman Press uh, <clears throat> uh, report with respect to the number of collisions and, and deaths that have occurred on uh, Highway 6. We've had these discussions. We continue to have these discussions. And, and, uh, and to, to use social media as a way to garner um, you know, input and advice when he's getting it from the mayors, from the councillors uh, on a regular basis is just, it's, it, it is frustrating. Uh, with respect to the same comment you brought up earlier, Councillor Corbett, uh, yes, uh, Toby was at that meeting uh, in Norfolk with, with the uh, a large contingent with respect to cannabis and uh, it's coming from uh, from his office that uh, <coughs> cannabis, produ cannabis production uh, is the responsibility of Health Canada and it is not a provincial responsibility and I beg to differ uh, when it respects with respect to Health Canada and giving out licenses to grow for health reasons that comes from the doctors who are licensed provincially through OHIP and, and through the Ontario Ministry of Health and it's the Ministry of Health that needs locally, Ontario, that needs to clamp down on how those licensings are, licenses are being issued. As you mentioned, Mike, you know, when someone garners a license to grow enough marijuana to, to feed a, a population, there has to be something wrong with that. That's not Health Canada. That's provincial. That falls into Toby's bailiwick. That falls into the provincial government's issues. And when I see these kind of posts, it just speaks to volumes and to the lack of disconnect that we see happening here locally. And, and so while we continue to fight and lobby for the people of Haldeman and for the people of Norfolk, it just it, it puts us at odds when we see our MPP in a silo that is completely alienated from everything that we are doing here both with Norfolk and Haldeman. That's my rant, uh, and uh, yeah, thanks for opening the door. <laughs> I'm sure that's not going to garner me, uh, uh, you know, accolades and flowers from uh, Toby's <coughs> office, but uh, but it needs to be said, and and and, and I, 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 you know, and I want to say this with respect, and that you know, we're all here to provide <coughs> a service and and and, rep and rep represent the people here, and I and and I I truly believe Toby's interest lies in doing that it's just simply we need to get him to 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 work better with us at, at a local basis we have the ear of the public you're out in the streets more often than any anybody else Norfolk has the ear of their public we have that ability to be able to channel that energy back to their office and and help facilitate these issues and it just frustrates me that you know I see these posts that would suggest that he's not aware of what's happening when we've made them very aware of these issues. So. Tony? Mr. Mayor, I couldn't, <clears throat> I couldn't agree with the mayor more. <clears throat> the only thing I can do, <clears throat> excuse me, is that is that on one other issue. Um, you, you mentioned the article in the, in the press last week about the, the danger, <clears throat> excuse me, on Highway 6. And I, think, and I think the reporter was talking about the danger on Highway 6 from Mount Hope right back south to Port Dover. And going through the Hagersville corridor as well but I got a call from a reporter and I was asked to comment on the issue of you know he was alluding to the fact uh, and Toby raised the issue in the article he's alluding to the fact of the of a potential bypass around Hagersville and I was asked to comment and I said no I'm not going to comment because in my personal view I didn't get re-elected by misleading or raising false hopes of people in my ward um, 
I, uh, people in my ward, <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, know that I've been calling for a bypass around the community for over 25 years. When Stelco and the refinery came out to Nanny Coke over 45 years ago, they were promised that there was going to be a bypass built uh, through Haldeman County out to Nanny Coke, if, if in fact they were willing to make the commitment of spending the billions of dollars they did making an investment in, in the in the industries that they built out there. It's never been done. The closest we've ever come to having a, a secured corridor to extend that bypass out to Nanticoke was under an NDP government, uh, the, the late Norm Jameson, uh, who was a former Stelco employee and MPP at the time that represented this riding, came as close as we've ever come to, to securing a corridor. So no, I wasn't gonna comment on the issue of the Hagersville bypass because We've tried and we've talked and we've met with the representatives at, at the provincial level and the federal level for that matter. And I'm not gonna raise the hopes of the residents of Hagersville when I know that there's no move afoot at the provincial level to attack that project. There, in my view, there should be. I think the community of Hagersville is, is had, had it, they're at their wit's end when it comes to the amount of tra truck traffic going through that community. But it was just another example and that article that frustrated me, and in my opinion, you're, mi you're misleading the people of Hagersville, and that's the wrong thing to do. Thank you. Other speakers before the mayor speaks again? <clears throat> Ken? So, to speak to raising hopes, uh, I have a letter today uh, from the Ministry of Transport that arrived from the Honorable Carolyn Mulrooney that says specifically that there's not enough traffic or accidents or tragic accidents on Highway 6 to warrant the final phase of the bypass from Caledonia to Mount Hope. So that's coming from the same government that is currently on social media asking whether it makes sense to have that particular extension. And so again, my frustration is, is that why are we not working more closely together? And one doesn't see what the other's doing. Um, I also had, with response to our meeting in AMO, uh, our ask for the rumble strips, which is, uh, as we know with the current staff, is being uh, undertaken and looking, uh, looking seriously at it. Uh, but with respect to our ask on the uh, connection of uh, our um, our uh, artery line on six to cross over to six line and pick up the bypass, the comment made from the MTO was that uh, that is not in their purview. It's not something that they would support unless they knew they were going to expand the highway and that if the local municipality was interested in putting uh, uh, interchange connections off six line, to assist with the traffic issues uh, on that side of Caledonia and, uh, and through a six line of Shweekin, as we know is grown, uh, that it would be up to us and that they would be willing to help us with uh, our environmental assessment process. So, so I, uh, I, I, I think that that tells us where, where we stand with respect to, to those issues. Thank you, I'm gonna wrap it up. And I, I do believe contrary to what was given by that minister that we've had too many fatalities on Highway 6 as of late. Getting back to what I brought up, the uh, extension of water, it's a major win for us. It's win <clears throat> for Six Nations. They get good potable water. Norfolk, uh, particularly Port Dover at this time is stunted with their growth as a result not having adequate water. For us, it would wean us off Hamilton uh, water and, and the operation of the uh, Nanny Coke unit would help share the cost. So with that, I'll pass it on to Engineering Capital Works, Councillor Metcalf. Uh, nothing here but uh, new business. I'm just gonna uh, call on uh, Phil uh, maybe you can give us an update with the cab. We have this tour coming up on uh, Thursday afternoon. And just if you'd like to make a couple of comments, Phil, please. Yeah, through the chair. So uh, things are progressing well. Uh, we have a occupancy meeting today, and um, I'm anticipating that we'll uh, 
have a, a partial occupancy. Uh, the main floor, we've got a few things to sort out over the next week or so. Um, uh, but uh, as far as um, the, uh, the building goes and the press releases that were issued uh, back uh, a couple weeks back, uh, we're still on target. Um, uh, so uh, <coughs> things are progressing well and uh, um, looking forward to the move. Thanks, Phil. Councillor Delmonte. Mr. Chairman, I have an issue on your other business. Okay, um, so over the last year, um, I'm, I'm starting to get more and more complaints um, about the situation on Highway 6 going through Hagersville. And just recently, um, the two crossing guards, we've got one on, if you're going through Main Street south uh, towards Jarvis, we have one located at Park Street and Highway 6 South, another one located at um, Park Tree Road and Highway 6 South, right, right next to, to Tim's Tires. One tends to uh, make sure kids get a, a, across that road to go to Hagersville Elementary over on Park Tree Road. The other one down by Tim's Tires is right next to St. Mary's uh, Catholic Elementary School. And so um, Tyson and I have met with the, the principal and the parent interest group about a year, a year and a half ago, I think, at St. Mary's to, to hear some of the same complaints that I'm hearing from the crossing guards. Um, but about two weeks ago, I contacted Mike Evers and we went to the uh, company that employs these guards and asked the guards, those two guards in particular, to start documenting some of the things that they're, they're seeing uh, during the day. <clears throat> and I was a little, you know, we got a response here back on January the 28th, and I was a little co I'm concerned about what these guards are, are witnessing on a day-to-day -day basis. Just a couple of weeks ago, they did a, a bit of a tabulation of what they noticed during the day for, one, for a one-week period. One of the guards talks about, you know, their perceived uh, 42 tr speeding transport trucks that are coming at them, one running a red light, um, at Park Tree Road and two near misses involving individuals. The other one at Main and Park Street talks about, again, about, <coughs> about 28 to 30 speeding transport trucks coming at them and, and two near misses with transport trucks. I, I know from representing the ward and from living there that if, if you stand out at those two locations at any particular time during working hours, um, I'm guessing there, there hasn't been counts, actual counts done on this for a number of years, but if you look at transport trucks alone running by those two intersections, I, I, would, I would bet money that you're probably somewhere between 60, and 60 to 100 trucks an hour going through those two locations. And the guards are, are telling me that traffic, uh, whether it be trucks or vehicular traffic, are, are not always obeying their orders to, to, to stop. And, and that's, um, I, I, th I know is a, it's a concern of mine, I know it's a concern of everybody's around the table. So I guess, Mr. Chairman, I'm asking, I'm asking staff to hold a meeting with the Crossing Guard Company, the MTO, anybody from the school that wants to participate, because I wanna hear, I, I'd like to hear, and I'd like to be invited to that meeting, I'd like to hear more opinions about what people are, are seeing there on a day-to-day -day basis and what they see as, as potential solutions because if we, don't, if we don't get anything concrete, we need to do something here. This is a situation that, that's not gonna get any better. Uh, it, it's a sign, it's a, it, you know, trucks going through the community are a positive sign of how busy our industries are and, and employing people and that's great. But this particular stretch of road has been a problem, will continue to be a problem until you channel some of that traffic around to the community. I'd be the first to admit that if I was standing out there with a paddle and there was an 18 wheeler coming at me loaded with whatever the material is, I'd be tim intimidated as well. Um, and I have to add that, you know, now I'm hearing it from the Chamber of Commerce in Hagerzell, I'm hearing it from several high profile business people in the community. They're seeing trucks running red lights. They're concerned about the speed and the volume of trucks that we're seeing coming through the community. I've had people tell me that some of these trucks are even running our stoplight down at the main intersection, which is just as disturbing. Um, but these guards have a responsibility to get these kids across the road. 
the owner of this company that employs these guards has the responsibility to continue to communicate with his guards and if he sees a problem it should be brought to, to Haldeman County's attention for us to take some kind of joint action that isn't happening and it's raising it's raised all kinds of questions in my mind about the the channel of communication here and where where the breakdown is so I spoke to the CEO about this this morning I'd like to see this meeting take place and I'd like to see what what the other people are saying from the school directly I know I know how the principal of st. Mary's feels about it I know how the parent interest group feels about it and I'm now I'm hearing it from other people in the community so it really bothers me and the MTO is great at telling us what to do along that highway well I think it's time for them to step up and attend this meeting and tell us how they're going to help us with this situation because they're the ones that insist that the volume trucks are not an issue I, I, I disagree and I think the majority of people in Hagersville would, would disagree but my primary concern is these kids and these guards the ability of these guards to get these kids across the street so I'm Mr. Chairman, I'd like to see this meeting take place, and we'll see what comes out of it. But failing that, if I don't see anything concrete, I'm tempted to bring a motion forward to this council to double the guards at those two locations because, to me, the primary concern is the, are these kids and parents that, that are trying to get across the street safely. I'll leave it at that. Absolutely. Thank you. Also, I believe that OPP maybe should attend that meeting as well, some of the representative from the OPP maybe. I, I spent over an hour on the phone with, with Belinda Rose describing the situation. I know that they've been out to talk to them, but I haven't had any communication back as to what they found or what their action plan is. I, I guess I'm going to have to follow up with them. Find out. Any other comments? New business? I'll turn this over to uh, Councillor Patterson. All righty. Thank you. The next report is on page 86 and 93. It's FIN-02-2020. Can I have a mover and a seconder to get it on the floor, please? Moved by Councillor Corbett, seconded by Councillor Lawrence. There's one recommendation. We're just receiving this for information. If you've read over this, there's a lot to absorb. It's pretty in-depth. So if you have any questions or comments for staff, for Mark, feel free. Councillor Sheraton. Just because you put it out there, we got some time to 11. So, <laughs> while well, it dragged the puck since we got the Mayor's Cup this weekend. Um, Mr. Merritt, um, have you seen any trends that have changed? Um, I know there's so much impact on residential um, and the lack of as industrial and commercial. Um, and I know we've heard from the farming group about their concerns about the rise in property values causing more impact on them. Um, do, have you noticed things that may allow f us to not be so, uh, um, so much of our impact on residential and maybe move to the other classes or can, maybe you can just update us? Uh, thank you, and through the chair, and it is a good question. <clears throat> and actually, uh, unfortunately, the answer is that we're seeing more of a shift to residential than we have in the past. So we've, uh, so we have had a shift, and the shift is predominantly to the residential. So we're, we're exceeding 78 percent of our total taxes are collected from the residential area. That's so right actually, there. it's a good lead-in for the presentation at 11 o'clock because we will see at the presentation that one of the issues we do have is our our Dependency percentage of, of taxes covered by the residential class is higher than the provincial average and actually higher than um, a number of the municipalities uh, surrounding us as well. So it is an issue. Uh, in re reality is to offset that, we'd, we'd need either commercial or industrial development to, to take some of that burden. Thanks. Thank you, Mark, for giving a shorter answer than the question. Um, <laughs> any other questions for staff? Seeing none, all those in favor of the recommendation motion? Down hands carried, thank you. The next report is on page 94 to 101, FIN-03-2020. This is to do with the interim tax levy and the, perhaps a chance of having to temporarily borrow for the year 2020. <coughs> There's seven recommendations on page 94, kind of a mover and a seconder to get it on the floor. Moved by Councilor Del Monte, seconded by Councilor Medcalf. Any questions for staff? Councilor Sherton. Um, I know we, we've looked at it, and maybe moving to the new building, it might give us more ability, um, because we basically have this 
three month period of of uh, that we basically carry for projects that we uh, want to start earlier in the year. Has there been any thought of trying to push towards the monthly payments? Um, and, and then, so basically, um, the first payment isn't so in March, it'd be much earlier in the year. I know there's been some dis discussions on it, but I didn't know with the new data system and moving to the new building if there'd be more ability to do that. Uh, through the chair, and uh, we do have uh, the ability to do pre-authorized monthly payments. So we do have, uh, we have seen a, a significant uptake in the pre-authorization over the last several years. And, but that's at the current time is the only ability to pay monthly. Uh, the municipality does have the ability to set uh, the due dates at any time it sees fit. Um, right now, you're, you're correct. We do have sort of a, you know, a standard set of uh, March, May, uh, August, and October. Uh, so there is a window between the end of October to the end of March. We don't have any. Uh, set uh, installments. It is something I think after we've uh, com fully completed the, uh, the implementation of the, the new ERP uh, uh, software solution that we can look at uh, having other available payment options to try to smooth those payments over uh, and we can move to, to monthly. There, there are some challenges with that uh, both for some taxpayers and uh, uh, you know with the administration wise but it is something we intend at looking at in the future again. And just following up, is there, I guess we can't really give incentives to, for more of the public to adapt to this monthly payment? Because I guess that would be looked at bonusing? Uh, through the chair, again, and correct, we, we can't provide incentives. There's uh, disincentives you miss a due date. Uh, uh, again, those things would all factor into evaluation of different due dates. Thanks. Further questions? Councillor Corbett? Yes, thank you. Uh, discussion with regard to the timing of our uh, budgets and my concern was that you have the opportunity to get your tenders out so people can bid on them early when they start looking at their jobs. If you get them out too late, they take a look at them and figure they don't need the job and they can stick you with them. How does this 50% uh, uh, availability for funding serve you in getting your tenders out or have you a past practice in looking at those tenders? Uh, through the chair and <clears throat> this particular report doesn't allow you to put out tenders earlier however uh, we did the budget guidelines uh, report earlier in the year council did authorize uh, staff the ability to do tendering uh, for standard state of good repair projects so any Thing that was in the 19 budget for 2020 that was stated good repair staff do have the ability to go out and tender those projects today despite the timing of the budgets in, in 2020 so that that ability is there albeit not uh, contained in part of this report itself so mr chairman we, we don't lose out by the fact that our budget meeting is delayed uh, through the chair and that's correct and we did that on, on purpose because of the timing of the budgets thank you thank you anything further Seeing none, I call the uh, the vote, please, on the seven recommendations. All in favor? That's carried. I have nothing else under uh, new business or unfinished business. I'll turn it over to C Councillor Lawrence. Yeah, we have uh, report HRD-01-2020, Health and Safety Policy and Program. Uh, do we have a mover to get her on the floor? Councillor Corbett, seconder. Councillor Delmani, any questions? Councillor Corbett? Yeah, if I may, to our HR people, with regard to all the uh, new legislation coming out, uh, <coughs> pre-existing conditions and these types of things, have we modified our hiring practice as a result of trying to pick a person who is right for the position they're going into? If you understand what I'm saying through that question. Yes, through the chair. Um, it's a good question. Um, so we're certainly aware of the legislation that's coming forward and we're tailoring our practices in terms of our health and safety programs around that. We have not changed our recruitment practices drastically um, to address the change in legislation. We're looking into opportunities there. Um, it's difficult to determine um, through an assessment how resilient someone is or how they would respond to a traumatic event. So it's definitely a, an interesting idea but not an easy one to solve. So as of right now we have not made changes in our recruitment practices but we continue to make other changes in terms of our health and safety program, how we respond to events, how we track things, and how we follow up um, following these types of exposures. My concern is that there are some people that can't handle their position 
that they're going into and are we able to take a overlook and see how it works out? Is there any way of pre-screening or? Uh, it's definitely an interesting concept. Uh, I don't know the answer, sure. Um, whether or not that's something that we could assess. I know we're hearing more and more about it because of the change in legislation. I don't know that there's an easy answer for you, but it's something that's on our radar. Thank you. It is a concern that people come in not fit for the job and all of a sudden there's problems and we end up with it. So that's my concern. And it's not only here. I see that in police services as well. Any further? Councillor Patterson? Yeah, through the chair, and then not, I guess I just want to highlight it just for my own, I guess the opposite question to Councillor Corbett would be, at the bottom of page 104, just to be clear, three employees that had pre-existing conditions, were they, did these conditions exist prior to being hired by the county, or was it injuries from work that happened during their tenure in the county? Um, so I don't have the details on those three specific ones, but when we call something a pre-existing injury, uh, it's typically something that's non-occupational, so not something that happened um, during their employment. So because we're a Schedule II employer, we don't have uh, discounts, I guess it's called on, in terms of our premium when a, a workplace injury is exasperated by a non-occupational, but it's definitely something that we um, take note of and we work with the WSIB when determining what's an appropriate award uh, for a WSIB claim. So for example, if somebody takes a longer time to recover from a workplace injury because of a non-occupational issue um, impacting that, then we would be looking at the award um, limiting payment to just the time associated with a workplace injury. Okay. No, thank you for that. And I'll just follow up. I guess when you're reading something in context and you have one sent sentence, different personalities will take different meaning from what, what we're reading, so thank you. Thank you. you. I know how you'd take it. No, I just, uh, you, you no I'm further questions or comments. <coughs> um, if I call for the motion, to all those in favor? Carried unanimously. Uh, next is uh, LSS 03-2020 insurance claims and litigation 2019. Have you received this information on page 116? Uh, motion on the floor to receive. <coughs> Councillor Patterson, seconder, <laughs> Councillor Metcalf. Any comments, questions? Nope. Okay. Call a vote. To all those in favor? Carried unanimously. Uh, other business. Uh, on page 121, we have correspondence from Gina McEntee, <coughs> Vice President of uh, Road to Recovery, requesting a road to support. Um, <coughs> Letter from Council. I have a mover on the floor. Councillor Corbett, second by Councillor Metcalf. Questions, comments? Councillor Shurton. And um, I, I know Councillor Corbett was uh, was emailed, and I was uh, contacted by a phone call. Um, she's got this opportunity to try to uh, move this a little bit more forward. They've had one program where they've had uh, kind of a educational training for people to kind of get off their addictions and 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 uh, and they're looking to hopefully make it maybe a, a secure a, a long-term uh, plan with a building and uh, keep it more of a, a permanent uh, opportunity for future um, growth uh, that will help assist uh, people in the Haldeman um, area so uh, I definitely support the the endorsement of this letter She's got a meeting coming up on Friday that she's hoping to get some funding. So I think with the support of this council, I think it will lend towards the the recognition of the need for this. And uh, that's, I guess, wanted to speak on that. So, Councillor Metcalf? Yeah, I had the opportunity to attend the graduation ceremony for the uh, Red Path program. Uh, they started with nine uh, participants, seven graduated. It's quite an intensive program that they run through. It's about a six-month program. I do know personally one of the gentlemen that uh, had graduated from the program before. It's a very worthwhile uh, program that uh, these people run. Um, they also have the uh, opportunity to build upon it, if you will. They're, uh, they're going to meet with a um, representative from the uh, 
mental health ministry, uh, Minister Tobolo. <clears throat> that is, I believe, like uh, Councillor Certain should, said, that that is on Friday. And uh, they're looking for support from Council, and I uh, wholeheartedly support a letter of support. Uh, anything we do to uh, <clears throat> enhance uh, the well being or mental health of our residents, and uh, I uh, fully support the. Uh, the motion and the uh, letter going forward. Thank you. Councillor Corbett. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I support the fact that we have uh, many uh, groups in our municipality who do, do receive ongoing operational funding from uh, the government. This fills a need, and I would like to see them uh, get that. I know in terms of operational funding, it's not the mandate of the municipality to provide that funding. It's the provincial government, and they hopefully they look kindly on this. So I do support it. Any further comments? Um, one final comment through myself. Uh, I couldn't agree with more with my fellow councillors that have made comments that any time that we can help, um, those that need help, absolutely, and, and this is the least that we can do. So um, call a vote. All those in favor? Carried. Uh, move that on to the mayor. No, Dan. Oh, sorry. sorry. Uh, I sorry. had just one Counselor other Arp. item. <laughs> just to um, just give council a heads up. I was at a meeting yesterday. You'll recall that um, as part of our priorities, we identified the need there's a legislative requirement for us to produce a um, community wellness and safety plan that's coming out of um, uh, some uh, the policing legislation. That has to be done by the end of the year. So I was at a meeting yesterday with Norfolk and um, the two counties, at least administratively, we've agreed to uh, do it together and cost share in the process. And so there'll be a report coming to council on that. but. Given the issues that we face are very similar, and given the uh, um, uh, the savings that we achieve and the efficiencies, we agreed to uh, do that together. And uh, Marlene Miranda's group is going to um, administer that project. Councilor okay. Gordon. Yes, if I may, you spoke about priorities, and in April, I believe we start our uh, coffee with the councilor. And for going forward, I'd like to have some cheat seats because I'm sure they're going to be asking about transportation. They're going to be asking about uh, affordable housing and where we are at with regard to ma major recreation. And the other thing that's coming up that I can't attend, I believe it's tomorrow night because I have another meeting, is uh, with the official plan if we can have those cheat sheets available so this is where we're at this is a projected timeline for looking at affordable housing and all this yeah. if you don't mind yeah kyra's uh, already got a program in that regard oh i'm sure you have thank you <laughs> oh councilor shirton just before we move off this uh backing up the topic so just because of the timelines for friday and not ratification on monday this letter of endorsement that got approved, is, is someone going to contact Gina and email her, or do you want Bernie and I to, to drop this letter off, or what would you suggest before Friday? Um, so first of all, I, I don't know if there is a resolution, but the resolution should indicate that um, it's the support and that uh, staff be directed to, to indicate that support. In which case, then I would say um, absolutely one or the two of you uh, drop it off. All we're doing is skipping the ratification. You're, yeah. you're essentially saying it's 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 approved as of today. Okay. Well, that's, I just wanted to admit, didn't know about that to get missed today. So maybe we should do that now. Okay. Okay. So that uh, moved uh, by myself and seconded by Councillor Corbett that the core sponsor on Gina McAtee VP Road to Recovery of Haldeman request for support dated January 26, 2020 be received and that the mayor be authorized to send a letter of support to the Road to Recovery of Haldeman prior to the February 7, 2020 meeting with the Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. All those in favor? Carried unanimously. Yes. Now we may move Just on. Just before moving on, um, there were 
two other items noted in Evelyn's email. Uh, the first was to do with the hired vehicle owner's licenses, which are set to expire on February 15th. So we have a motion to extend that. And the other one was with respect to report LSS 01 uh, 2020. There's a, a, a change that needs to be made. So I'll give those both to you. Oh, see the end. Okay. <coughs> just back on the other item, uh, Bernie, maybe when you at break, just maybe just give Donna sort of the outline of what you're looking for in terms of the letter, and she can have that drafted up and done, completed today before you leave. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, first, uh, first one moved by me, seconded by Councillor Corbett, that the current hired vehicle owners' licenses, which are set to expire on February 15, 2020, be extended until April 15, 2020, <coughs> to allow for council review of the hired vehicle licensing bylaw and potential changes to the hired vehicle operation framework. <sighs> Councillor Shurton. Can explain to me this hired vehicle. I, I'm totally lost. I'm sure the public would be. Can you explain what hired vehicle is? Yes, I can. So staff are working on the taxi uh, okay. licensing bylaw. Yeah. And that's, it's hired vehicles because it covers. Yeah, but I think one. if you would have had that word taxi in that, yeah. it'd be easier for the people so, to understand. The I thought yeah, that's so maybe what it was. I, the name of the bylaw is hired vehicles. It includes taxis, but it may include may other types other things. of okay. hired vehicles. So staff are working on that. We actually were close to getting a report to this round, but we didn't quite make it. So we're going to be bringing it the next round. However, because the licenses expire, okay. we just need to pass a motion to extend their license until we can deal with the report next round. And um, I'm going to be trying to set up a meeting with the mayor to go over that uh, bylaw before we get to council as well. Okay. Bernie, then the mayor. Thank you. As I said, I was contacted by one of the fellows who involved, and there's some concern with regard to vehicles, and I know we get into it with regard to the uh, public works, too, is having adequate sh insurance to provide that type of service, and we're expecting 24-7, the concern that it be opened up to everybody in terms of what was going on. We have difficulty when we get complaints from the citizens that they can't get a taxi after 11 o'clock, so hopefully it comes forward with those concerns addressed. Mr. Mayor? So, yeah, just to add on that, I just to remind Council, it stems from the frustration in the public that uh, being able to access uh, the taxis at a time that uh, that many do seem to need it, and, and, and the idea of 24-7 seems to always become the challenge. And, and so I think the direction to staff was to look at the bylaw and possibly opening it up uh, to, you know, to, to make it certainly more competitive, uh, but, but a better service overall for the community so that we don't have um, you know, the calls coming in after the weekends that uh, these taxis are, are, are not available. And so there's a, a false sense of, of, of idea that there's a service being provided. And so if we're going to license them, then we need to somehow be able to ensure that they are providing that service specifically at the times where they're most needed, which is always the Friday nights and Saturday nights. And, and, and that seems to be always the concern. So, so we're waiting to see that. Uh, and uh, I know Kathy and I will have a pretty candid discussion on that one pretty soon. Yeah. Any more questions, concerns, comments? No. Okay. All those in favor? Mm -hmm. Carried. <laughs> Next one is uh, that with respect to report LSS-01-2020 unsolicited offer from Reynolds, vacant land on George Street in Dunville, and further to the recommendation, 16 passed <coughs> at the January 14th, 2020 Council and Committee meeting and adopted at the January 22, 2020 Council meeting. The property legally described as part of pin number 38111-0115LT being part of lots four and five, plan 1407, be confirmed as being retained by Haldeman County and not being declared surplus in accordance with option number one as outlined in the confidential memorandum LSS-M01-2020. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Corbett. 
Any questions, comments? Councillor Corbett? Uh, just a clarification. I think this was subject to perhaps a, a discussion coming back about the Northwest Quadrant and the outcome there, too. By passing this motion, are we saying that we're not going to consider it any longer? So, um, through the chair, this motion that's on the table right now is a correction from the last. So it doesn't change the council's intent from the last meeting. What happened was when the motion was amended at the last meeting, we forgot to take out this declaring it surplus part. So um, mm -hmm. technically, we declared it surplus, even though council's wishes were to retain it for now. So we just have to correct that past motion. It doesn't change the intent, doesn't change the discussions going forward um, and the direction to staff. It's just a uh, technicality. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Yeah. Okay. All those in favor? Carried. Now I believe, Mr. Mayor, on to you. And there's no items uh, with respect to corporate affairs. And there was no other business, I don't think. And uh, we're still a little early for our 11 o'clock uh, session. So minutes of the police services board uh comments council uh, uh, i move and would like to uh, make a comment so seconded councillor shirton if i may uh, one of the things that's popped up for us is the fact that uh, we received a letter from inspector carter indicating that they're looking at a proposal for additional staffing <coughs> to police the courthouse five hundred thousand dollars plus this is a major major expenditure it could be one percent of our, our tax increase so the direction from police services board was to put it back to staff for consideration and i for direction as well and I know the CAO has been quite involved in giving us that type of direction so as it stands with the police services board we we're looking for direction from staff as to which way we go so with that uh, I'll leave it there any other comments uh, unfinished business is none. New business is uh, the resolution, as you see, with respect to 911 uh, missiles, a plague that continues to dog everybody. Councillor Corbett. Yeah, I, I would make a motion that we support it, if that be the case. It has a great benefit for us. I know we are call. Uh, I should say we are charged for calls for service. For our municipality, 21.56% of the calls for service are uh, miss 911 missed dials. This is an, a, a controllable expense. If we can do anything to reduce it, and this is a suggestion, you take a look at the industry, if they can do something for us. When we are charged, that's one in five calls is a 911 missed dial. We have police officers that could be used in other areas. We are charged 1.3 hours and at least two officers go out for those events. So I think it's uh, a good idea that we support it to, and uh, see if we can get something from the industry. So whatever resolution will further that. So just uh, a little housekeeping here. I, I, uh, I had a motion on the floor with respect to the minutes of the Police Services Board. So uh, it was moved by Councillor Corbett, seconded by Councillor Shirton, and uh, get that off the floor. All those in favor? That's carried unanimously. And with respect to your comments, Councillor Corbett, if you so prefer, I have a motion here that you can move, uh, whereas the calls, actually, it's identical to the to Tecumseh's uh, motion. <coughs> Looking for a seconder, Councillor Patterson. And as it's written in that uh, resolution, it's identical. Uh, all those in favor? That's carried unanimously. Oh, inquiries, announcements? Councillor Metcalf, Councillor Sheridan. Uh, NPCA has hired their uh, new CAO, uh, 
Chandra Sharma, and uh, she follows Gail Wood, who was there on an interim basis, comes highly recommended, and lots of uh, positive experience in the uh, environmental world. So we're all looking forward to working with her on the NPCA, which has now grown in membership to 21 members. So, <laughs> not bad for uh, what, that they employ 43 people and we have 21 board members. <laughs> yeah. so, uh, just an announcement there moving forward. Yeah. Uh, my announcement is uh, the Dumble Junior Mudcats, uh, they are going to be facing the Grinsby Peach Kings uh, in the first round. And on Valentine's, February 14th, um, they'll be hosting game four at 7.30. Following that will be a Valentine's dance, and uh, there's some raffle tickets of a Wendell Clark signed Maple Leaf shirt for anybody who's interested. Um, you can see me for tickets. And it's, again, it's a fundraiser for the Dumble Junior Mudcats, and come out and support them. Um, hopefully they can get by the first round, but Grinsby did finish first, so they did win a couple games against them. So good luck to our Dumble Junior Mudcats. Any others? Uh, two, uh, one's a positive announcement, one's kind of an odd one, but uh, the uh, Norfolk County's been going through their uh, deliberations with respect to budget process, and uh, they've had some significant challenges in, uh, in meeting their, uh, their, their numbers. Um, certainly a lot uh, more difficult process, I think, happening up there than what we will experience, but <coughs> Uh, there's been several comments as they were deliberating and looking at uh, ways at uh, saving uh, dollars and and uh, and some of the conversation that happened on the floor uh, were to do with synergies or possible synergies with Haldeman County and while we always uh, have casual conversations with uh, the mayor and the council and the and, and I know I'm sure staff do as well um, the the only real formal conversation we've had in terms of uh, a synergy and that that's been so far this uh, water project uh, I just want to make it very clear that uh, uh, that there hasn't been anything formal with respect to uh, EMS uh, respect to fire services and that uh, uh, this council and certainly this mayor is not uh, uh, looking at, um, at staff uh, cuts or 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 shorting uh, our service with respect to all the men in Norfolk to bring uh, some kind of uh, regional type police uh, fire and EMS and so it uh, there was I think some discussion out there in Norfolk that would have alluded to that and and I I want to be sure that our staff uh, are, are very clear knowing that that's not uh, taking place that this council hasn't uh, started those uh, those processes and uh, I, I, I you know, I'm always uh, certainly interested in hearing ideas that uh, where we can save dollars and, and be as efficient or more efficient. Um, but uh, but I, I, I fail to see where that one there in particular, that one really brings us a value in terms of improving upon our service. So I just, it, it did come to, uh, to light. It happened on the floor of Norfolk and Craig had brought it up to my attention and I just want to be sure that, uh, that we're all of the same opinion. And, uh, and it's official that uh, May 22nd, uh, the ninth uh, annual gala is, uh, is going to occur. Uh, and oddly enough, for those of you that are uh, as old as I am, um, David Wilcox is still performing. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, Keith Richards, too. <laughs> and uh, David Wilcox will be coming to Haldeman County to, uh, to perform, and uh, I, I, I'm eagerly looking forward to the riverboat fantasy and everything else that goes along with it. Might even see me up there doing the Bearcat. I don't know. But, uh, it, uh, no, did you say May 22nd? May 22nd. It's a Friday. This oh, so it's year. going to be a Friday. Okay, I just Friday. I noticed that. I wanted to clarify that. So it is a Friday night. Yeah. Okay. And uh, we will be announcing the recipients uh, shortly. There's uh, 
top of my head, I think there's about 16 that have uh, have uh, applied, and so we're uh, we're just going through that. Uh, we will make those announcements uh, shortly. I, usually, what I'll do is I'll send out to councillors uh, the recipients that have applied. I'll ask for your input because uh, our intent is to try to balance the uh, you know the, the the beneficiaries across the county so that everybody can uh, share in that win. And uh, just to remind is that uh, it's their ninth year, uh, but uh, um, more importantly, it's raised uh, over a million dollars uh, in, the, in the nine years, actually in the eight years. So the nine, this ninth year has uh, is, is, is put us into a whole new threshold. And, uh, and so it's, 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 uh, it's been a good run. Um, it's, I know Phil's shaking his head because uh, nine years ago, he would have looked at me and said, I can't see that working, but, uh, but here we are, and uh, <laughs> it, uh, it's, been a, it's been a fun one. Uh, we, we, we are making a change uh, this particular year uh, with the uh, venue and uh, out on Highway 6 in Caledonia with the golf club. We're, uh, we're locating it there uh, for this year to try it. It's, uh, and the reason we're trying it, a uh, couple, is, uh, is, is the cost uh, for us to bring the event to the arena in terms of bringing all the equipment, tables, all of that stuff uh, is excessive. This could be an opportunity for us to save some money, uh, but at the same time, it's an opportunity to showcase the, uh, the, the new facilities that are there that, uh, that have the, uh, you know, the ability to host such an event of this stature. So, so it, uh, tickets are available, and Donna has, uh, has them at, uh, and uh, if you're able to attend, uh, it's a fun night, and, uh, and uh, hopefully you can get up there on the dance floor and do the Bearcat. <laughs> and that brings us to almost 11 o'clock. So, so should we take, yeah, we'll take a couple minutes break and we'll move to 11. Um, I'll come and see you.
but uh, we're still here. <laughs> and uh, oh, I walked out to the office without my glasses, so I'm going to have to struggle on this one. <laughs> <laughs> Tough to get old. <laughs> Told you I was as old as Dave Wilcox. <laughs> uh, there we are. So we are um, fortunate to have Jim Brzees here with uh, BMA Consultants, who's going to speak and present uh, the, uh, his findings uh, and report uh, as a municipal study and where Haldeman County sits with respect to a number of uh, related peer groups and other municipalities and I know going through this report there's some uh, some good exciting and positive news and uh, we're happy to have you here Jim thank you worship members of council um, yeah what I'd like to do is review the highlights of the 2019 uh, municipal study uh, Haldeman's been a participant over the last four years um, so this year I'm able to show some of the trends uh, with, res with results of some of the indicators. Uh, 110 municipalities did participate. That represents uh, over 85% of the population of the province of Ontario. Um, for illustrative purposes, what I'm doing, I'll show graphically the comparison of Haldeman in comparison to nine Ontario municipalities uh, that were selected either by geographic location or population. These nine municipalities, this is the, I believe the fourth year I've done this presentation. So we've, uh, use the same uh, municipalities for comparative purposes. Uh, so um, Haldeman is being uh, prudent in, t uh, in terms of sound fin financial health and it's regularly uh, uh, reporting and has uh, timely, uh, has prepared uh, timely uh, financial condition assessments uh, and has participated as I said in this study uh, for the last four years. So that helps form the foundation of long range financial policies. Uh, in the financial condition assessment, we look at various factors. We look that could affect the financial condition assessment. We look at the community profile, uh, affordability indicators, uh, revenues, expenditures, and financial indicators, debt and reserves. So uh, when I go through my presentation, I've broken it down uh, to three main areas, as I mentioned, growth and socioeconomic indicators. That's looking at population, uh, building construction activity assessment, the levy, uh, how much you levy, the taxes and affordability indicators, and then finally financial position indicators looking at reserves and debt and financial position of the, of the municipality. So firstly, with regard to the growth and socioeconomic indicators, as I said, there's a, there's a number of growth and socio, socioeconomic indicators. Uh, they're largely external to the county's, county's control, but really important to understand from a planning and forecasting perspective. Uh, these, are, these are the municipalities that I, I mentioned previously that we're comparing against. Uh, <clears throat> so you can see from the, the listing there, the, the pop 2019 estimated population. Uh, these population estimates were prepared by Manifold Data Mining, which is a highly recognized group in, in uh, population forecasting. I, I've also shown land area and uh, land density uh, population per kilometer. Um, so uh, you can see from this, uh, just looking at the comparative municipalities, that um, you have a, a very large geographic area with a low population density. So this requires a lot more linear infrastructure uh, funded by fewer people. Um, just to give you an example on that, uh, I looked at roads, and uh, in the case of roads, when I looked at the cost per kilometer, which we capture, of roads, you're amongst the lowest in maintaining roads on a cost per kilometer basis. But when I look at it on a cost per capita basis, again, because you have a low population, uh, a large number of roads in relation to that population, on a per capita basis, you're amongst the highest of all of the municipalities in the survey. Uh, on the cost of roads. So as I say, it's, it's, uh, you're doing a good job operationally. Your, your cost uh, to maintain the roads is low. However, you do have a large number of roads uh, relative to your population base. Um, so when we look at, as I say, growth and socioeconomic indicators and I compare against the uh, peer municipalities, the group average on the peer municipalities over the last two years, and again, this is based on manifold data uh, estimates, was 2.7% uh, 
And over the last couple of years, it's or is estimated that uh, Haldeman grew by about 2.4%. When you look at the survey average, which is including the 110 municipalities, and included in that, obviously, are all of the fast growth GTA municipalities, the, the uh, population change, percentage population change of the group average was 4.5%. Uh, so change, changes in population it will impact both uh, revenues and expenditures. And what we see in, your, in terms of your population projections, you're entering into a period of increased growth. Um, so the implications of that are firstly that uh, all, no, uh, all growth does not pay for itself. Um, there's a, a number of factors in the calculation of the development charges where you have to discount certain soft services. Um, and uh, there's some uh, capital growth related items that may benefit future population that can't be included in the development charge. Um, so there, there's uh, implications uh, potentially with regard to um, the uh, costs that will be incurred in Haldeman uh, as a result of new growth. In addition to that, uh, you have an infrastructure, a substantial amount of infrastructure, as I talked about, and uh, a lot of that infrastructure is aging. And like every other Ontario municipality, you have an infrastructure gap. So you're going to be faced with a situation of replacing the existing infrastructure and the capital needs to service new growth. Uh, in terms of uh, demographics, when we look at, uh, again, it's, it's important to understand demographics and the trends on demographics because it could impact uh, some of your services and service levels in certain areas. Uh, and so what we see from this is that uh, in terms of Haldeman on the left-hand side, uh, from 2011 to 2016, you can see the proportional per percentage change of each of the groups. Uh, the 65-plus group, uh, is the fastest growing se segment, and it increased from 15.7% uh, of the total population in 2011 and represents 18% in uh, 2016, uh, a 2.4% increase. And then when you look at the, uh, the provincial averages, uh, the, the population uh, 65 and plus represents about 16.7%. So you're, you're, you're 65 plus age population is, is uh, higher than the provincial average. And as I say, it's increasing, and it's expected that that will increase uh, substantially <coughs> over the next uh, few years. Um, so as I say, it, it's important to understand this trend because it, it could affect some of your services and service levels. Rob? Just a quick question on that demographics, because when you look at Ontario, you're going to notice there's a lot of new immigrations coming in, the younger people and stuff too, but how does this compare? Did you break it down, uh, the nine municipalities that you did your, like, where's your comparisons there for the age demographics? Uh, I, I do have that. I don't have it uh, on, on a slide. Is it much different? Like It's, it's similar to, to uh, what we see in Haldeman. Okay, so it is, so we're not... It's, it's yeah, um, because of those, po oh, I'm sorry to interrupt, those populations, are, are those uh, municipalities um, are not, uh, do not include any of the fast growth GTA municipalities. So on the uh, right-hand side, when you're looking at Ontario, that's the driving factor. Uh, yeah, and that's what I want to get across, is right. that how do we compare to our nine? Okay, thank you. Similar question, if I may, on population. What connotation has that for us? Should we be directing our services towards seniors, or what? what? Uh, that, that's something that uh, you're going to have to decide. You're going to have to look at your service, service levels, the levels of participation, and, and as a result of that analysis, um, that could drive some of the service levels uh, for, in particular, uh, when you see this aged group, uh, services to the aged. A lot of municipalities right now, I'm not sure of the situation here in Haldeman, but a lot of municipalities are doing extensive studies on servicing aged population. Are we essentially becoming a bedroom community or, or a retirement area for uh, seniors? I, I'm, I'm not 100% sure of the situation, but I know there's been a lot of residents that have been here for their whole lives, basically, and, and starting to age. But what I do see is that uh, you are incurring a lot of growth uh, in the forecast, and uh, you've experienced growth over the last couple of years. And I think uh, um, 
that growth is, is mainly in the uh, working age population that have children. So, you'll see so that's, that's going to kind of balance that out as well. Thank you. Okay. Um, so we look at uh, building construction activity, and, and you can see from the chart on the left-hand side, this is your building construction activity from 2011 to 2018. You know, it's, it's, it's quite vol volatile. Uh, from 2014 to 2017, that has been trending upward. Uh, it decreased in 2018, but my understanding is in 2019 you had uh, quite extensive uh, construction activity. Um, the important thing to look at here, too, is on the right-hand side is the proportion of construction activity uh, between residential and non-residential. Um, the, uh, the services provided by Ms. Paldi are generally, the operating costs are generally higher to service residential population. So what you want to see is, is a good mix between the residential and non-residential uh, activity. And you have a, a good high, healthy balance. Uh, over the last five years, uh, the split between residential and non-residential has been about 51-49, 51% uh, residential and 49% uh, non-residential. So that's a good, good healthy uh, split in terms of construction activity. What, what you tend to see in this is that uh, um, the construction activity tends to kind of follow a little bit the, uh, the activity in, in terms of population growth. Uh, weighted assessment composition. Uh, this weighted assessment is, is how you distribute your taxes. And you can see that um, in terms of the survey average, uh, on average, in the total survey, 70% of the taxes generated are from the residential sector, 25% uh, from the ICI sector, and about 4% to the uh, uh, farmlands. Uh, in the case of, and then the group average, you can see uh, similar, it's similar to, the, very similar to the survey average. In the case of Haldeman, approximately 79.4%, almost 80% of your taxes are generated from the residential sector, and only 16% from the ICI sector, which I say is less costly to operate, so there's some implications there, and 4.6%, which is uh, higher than the group average for uh, uh, taxes re recovered from the farmlands. Uh, the thing to look at, too, is the richness of the assessment base, and how we determine that, we look at your total weighted assessment, and we divide it by population to get some indication on a per capita basis how much assessment is generated in the municipality. And you can see from this that uh, on a weighted population basis, uh, weighted assessment basis rather, your total assessment is about 133,182 uh, per person, where the group average is slightly higher and the survey average is, is 165,000. This is, a, this is a, a result of what I, the slide I just showed you. Uh, you have a lower proportion of uh, ICI um, assessment, and uh, so that's one of the reasons why it's, it's uh, slightly lower than the other uh, group average and survey average. Uh, assessment change, so uh, again, you, you want to monitor your assessment change. You want to, you know, obviously ensure that it is going up every year. Uh, you can see from 2009, oh, sorry, that should say uh, 2016 to 2018, uh, the assessment increase was 6.9% in Haldeman. Uh, the group average, which in, again includes those GTA municipalities, was about 7.3%, but the survey average was 6. Uh, six percent, so you're slightly higher than the survey average in terms of your assessment increase over the last three years. Um, as I say, too, it's, it's important to have an understanding of all this in relation to household income. So we look at average household income. Uh, again, uh, these statistics were derived using the 2016 uh, Stats Canada, uh, plus updated uh, by Manifold Data Mining. Uh, and in Haldeman, the average household income was about just over $100,000. Uh, the group average was about $91,000. Uh, the survey average, which again includes those uh, GTA municipalities, is about $105,000. So your average household income is higher than the group average, but below the survey average. Um, so the next section I want to look at is the uh, financial indicators. Uh, so we. we we break down, you, you want to make sure you, there's three 
broad criteria that look at in assessing the financial indicators. One is sustainability. Uh, you want to make sure that you're living within your means. Uh, flexibility. Uh, if there's any emergency type situations that arise, you want to make sure that uh, you have the flexibility to, uh, to adapt to any of those changes. And then vulnerability, the extent to which uh, you rely on money that you can't control. So we have, uh, you can see from each of the uh, charts there, uh, each of the, the uh, sections, uh, indicators on each one of those. <clears throat> and what I'll do is I'll just kind of go through each of those indicators. Um, the financial position, uh, this is an important indicator um, to look at. What it is, essentially, it's all of the financial assets less the financial liabilities that you have. Um, so when you look at this indicator on the uh, left-hand side, in again, using 2018 data, uh, the group average, um, the financial position was a positive $225 per person. Uh, the survey average was $517, and in Haldeman, it's $1,523. So in terms of overall net financial position, uh, you're amongst the best in the entire survey of 110 municipalities. Uh, so again, too, it's important to understand the trends on this because you want to make sure that you know, it's going positively if, as much as possible. And you can see from 2015 to 2018, there in fact was a positive trend on net financial position. Uh, then we look at the financial position, not just on a, on a per capita, but uh, on a weighted assessment basis. And uh, you remember I mentioned that your weighted assessment is slightly lower than other municipalities. So when you look at your financial position on a weighted assessment basis, you're 1,143, again, substantially higher than the, uh, the group average. And in fact, the survey average, looking at those uh, municipalities, nine municipalities, uh, it was a negative position of 175. Uh, so on a, on a per 100,000 avoided assessment, again, you're, you were near the top of the, the group of 110 municipalities in the, in the total uh, survey. Uh, asset consumption. Again, uh, it, it's important to look at this from the perspective. What this tells you, it's the historical cost of the asset, less accumulated amortization. Um, so you can see on the tax, uh, you're at 52%, and that means that 52% of the tax-related assets, the assets that are financed from tax purposes, um, the accumulated amortization used, used up about 52% of those assets. So that, that, what does that indicate? That indicates that uh, there's potentially a need for uh, replacing those assets in the, in the near future. When you look at it in comparison to the group average and the survey average, they're lower than you. So um, as I say, you do have good financial flexibility in terms of the financial position, um, but it's important to be aware that uh, there are potential infrastructure needs um, in accordance with uh, the uh, consumption ratio. Uh, for water, you're at 38 percent, and for wastewater, you're at 37 percent. Uh, so one of the things to make sure that you have adequate resources is, is you want to set aside reserves. Um, and you also want to set aside reserves for one-time expenses. You don't want to impact the taxes on one-time costs. Uh, you want to ensure adequate co cash flows. And you want that flexibility to manage debt levels. So we look at your, your tax reserves. Again, this is reserves related to your taxes, um, excluding water and wastewater. Uh, the group average, when you look at tax reserves as a percentage of own source revenues, and again, this is an indicator used by credit rating agencies when they do the evaluation of the credit worthiness of a municipality. Uh, the group average was 51%. The survey average was 56%, and you're at 142%. So you have 142% of tax reserves as a percentage of own source revenue. Uh, and, then, and again, too, that uh, looking at that trend, uh, it went from 139 to 142%. Uh, it's improved over the last couple of years. Uh, in fact, when you look at uh, the tax reserves in comparison to own source revenues, uh, you're the second highest in the survey of 110 Ontario municipalities. That represents over 85% of the population of Ontario. Um, water reserves looked at the same thing. In terms of water reserves, you're 123%. Uh, of own source revenues, and it has been, your reserves have been trending upward 
you can see on the right-hand side. In terms of wastewater, you're at 216%, and uh, it has been trending up as well. Uh, the next indicator is looking at debt, and uh, one of the indicators for debt, we look at debt on a per capita basis. Um, you're at $593 uh, per capita for, for tax-related debt. Uh, the group average was 842 and the survey average was 509 So you're just slightly above the survey average. Uh, when you look on the, uh, the trend line, uh, you've actually improved in that, uh, that met metric. Uh, went from $618 per capita to 593 So it's been trending down over the last four years. Uh, total debt outstanding per 100000 of assessment. Again, uh, you want to look at an assessment basis because that's the, the, the basis on which you raise taxation. Um, the survey average was $570. You're at $629, and uh, it has been trending lower. Uh, another indicator, uh, it's used by credit rating agencies as well. Um, and they, they indicate that uh, on this indicator, it's looking at your total debt to reserve ratio. And they'd like to see when, when evaluating the credit worthiness of a municipality, a one-to-one -one ratio. Uh, you can see on the, on the right-hand side in comparison to the, uh, the other peer municipalities, it was 0.8. So that means that uh, uh, they have 80 cents in uh, reserves for every dollar in debt. And you have... Um, um, 30 cents of debt, sorry, the opposite way, 30 cents of debt for every dollar in reserves. Uh, so you're much better Had than me. Had me thinking there for a minute. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> me too. <laughs> it's been a long day already. Uh, taxes receivable, again, it's important to look at taxes receivable. It, it's one of the indicators of the, uh, the local economy. Uh, and uh, what we and uh, credit credit rating agencies like to see that uh, tax receivable as a percentage of tax levies to be uh, lower than ten percent, uh, and in fact uh, you're you're slightly lower. You're at nine point four percent. You're higher than the survey average and higher than the group average. But again, when you're looking at the trend, uh, that trend has been improving over the last four years. So your taxes receivable as a percentage of tax levy has been decreasing. Um, cost of service and affordability indicators. Uh, so the, we're, we're looking at levy per capita. This is the net uh, taxes on a per capita basis. And we understand there's a lot of variations and, and variables looking at this. There's different service levels, um, residential, non-residential assessment composition that we talked about. There's socioeconomic uh, differences that in, could uh, impact some of the services and service levels. Uh, user fee policies ha have a, an impact, uh, whether you're recovering the full cost of service or not, uh, and age of infrastructure. So w when you're looking at it, uh, you got to be a little bit careful in the sense that it's not an apples to apples. But um, it, it's, it's important to look at, and, uh, and it's important when you see some of these differences, your levy per capita may be higher than other municipalities. Um, you want to understand the reasons why and whether it's controllable or uncontrollable. Um, so we look at uh, levy per capita. Holman's net levy, you can see from this chart, is 1,403 per capita. In comparison to the group average, which was 1,575, uh, it's, it's higher, and then the survey average was higher yet, it's 1,620. So your net levy per capita is amongst the lowest in the peer group and lower than the total survey average. So there, there's no issues on the uh, spending side. Um, when you're looking at the levy, remember I mentioned that the uh, assessment uh, is, is uh, lower than the group average and the survey average, so it's important to look at it from the, from the assessment perspective. But uh, again, you're, you're lower than the uh, survey average and the group average. Uh, so we looked at uh, some relative properties, um, and what we do is, is we, we try to take in each of the municipalities, what we call like properties. So we will pick a sample number of properties what we, in the bungalow, just for an example. And then in that sample, we want to, as I say, it's like properties. So we have criteria that we look at when we're finding these properties. It's, uh, you know, 1,500 square feet, 50 by 100 foot lot, uh, single car garage, that type of thing. And then so we pick the same, uh, same types of um, 
uh, residential units in each of the municipalities. So when you're looking at it on that base on the bungalows, uh, you're at a, and we calculate the taxes based on the average assessment of those sample properties. You're at 3,409, so you're lower than, I'm sorry, the group average is 3,409. Uh, Haldeman is 3,421, 3, you're a little bit higher, and then the survey average is, is higher yet. Uh, and on a two-story home, you're a little bit lower than the survey average and the group average. So as I said, the, one of the things you're, you're spending is low, but when you look at it on this, what's driving these numbers is that richness of the assessment base. You have a lower ICI uh, assessment relative to other municipalities. Uh, water and wastewater costs, you're, you're lower than the group and the survey average. Um, and then so what we do is we, we combine um, the property taxes and the water and wastewater. And you can see on a co combined basis, um, you're lower than this survey average and, and the group average. Um, so when you look at property taxes as percentage of average household income, on this indicator what we did is we took all of the residential assessment and um, divided it by the number of units, residential units, to come up with an average residential uh, assessment basis. And, uh, and then we applied the tax rates to that. So you can see from this indicator, uh, property taxes as a percentage of average, average household income, you're lower than the uh, survey average and the group average. You're about 3.4% and the survey average is 3.7% uh, and the group average is 4%. Uh, uh, and then when we roll the uh, water and wastewater costs into that to get the total municipal impact on a uh, residential homeowner, in Haldeman it's about 4.4% lower than the survey average and lower than the group average of about 5.2 percent. Uh, going, going forward, if you do this again, can you indicate on these slides, is it a better position to be low or high? Because oh, okay. for the average person, they look at that, they say, okay, what's this really mean? Mm -hmm. So if, if you'd indicate it's better to be low or high here, I think it may be more beneficial to explain. Yeah, certainly I'll do that. Yeah. When the word says tax at the top, you want to be low. <laughs> <laughs> How long has he been here? <laughs> I get it. I understand it. I'm just thinking, of, I'm just going to explain it to people. It might be easier for the average Joe is what I'm saying. Yeah. But thanks for the American <laughs> clarification. Are you referring to me? <laughs> yeah, not directly. <laughs> Uh, so ju just to wrap up, there, there are a couple things that, uh, I, again, no, no big concerns at all, uh, but things to be uh, uh, aware of, uh, especially looking at some of the trends. Uh, population growth we talked about, uh, cons construction activity, it is volatile. Um, and uh, you, again, you want to continue to monitor that and make sure that you have uh, sufficient growth in the ICI sector. Um, the tax asset consumption ratio, we saw in the, uh, especially in the tax side, you, you're at a 52 percent uh, in terms of the consumption ratio. So um, you, you want to be aware, uh, cognizant of that and, and make sure that sufficient funds are uh, put in reserves to deal with a timely replacement of your capital infrastructure. And then uh, tax receivable, um, you're, you're close to that 10 percent uh, uh, target that uh, credit rating agencies look at, um, but uh, you have been trending lower in that regard. And uh, in terms of the levy per capita, again, uh, we looked at the uh, spending and levy per capita, there was no issues. Um, and looking at the uh, taxes as a affordability, uh, again, no issues in that regard as well. And, and that's the end of the presentation, Your Worship. Just a question with regard to um, the taxes, um, receivables not coming in. Um, we seem to be higher, even though it's trending down, but we're higher than some other municipalities, and yet things are pretty rosy here in Haldeman County. Any Reader's Digest version of what, why? Uh, through your worship, and uh, uh, the encouraging thing is it's trending down. I mean, uh, we have been uh, concentrating on collections on those. I, I would. The main things we see, we, we do a, more of a deep dive into our receivable or taxes receivable. It's 
It's more current receivables, so it's not older receivables. So when the province did change, uh, you can do tax sales after two years. So we, we are very aggressive on the tax sales side of it. So it, we don't have a lot of older properties with receivables. So it's it's more current stuff, and a lot of it uh, tends to be stuff that gets added to the tax roll, like uh, bylaw infractions, unpaid water, wastewater. So they're paying the regular taxes, and so we've got a, a large number of small dollars relative to the value of the homes outstanding. So. Uh, which is, is good from a sort of affordability perspective in the sense that it's not large dollars on, on a, a small value of homes. Uh, and, and, and additionally, we have a, a couple uh, older properties that uh, have environmental concerns that, uh, you know, we have two properties in that area that have substantial taxes until those environmental issues are, are dealt with that uh, we can't really collect the taxes on them. So once those get cleared up, I think you'll see a, a, a significant improvement as well. So those are sort of the two factors that drive our receivables. Maybe just elaborate on that as well, Mark. The, is there like tools that the other municipalities that are using to to get their numbers down significantly lower than ours that we're not deploying? Like, is, is it seems like the averages seem to be suggesting that you know something's working elsewhere? A three worship, and we, and we have looked at the, what other municipalities are doing. I mean, particularly on the. Uh, like the ability to tax sale properties were very aggressive, much more aggressive than other municipalities. I think uh, the difficulty with current taxes, there's not a lot of leverage and you want to start, unless you're going to start using sheriffs and taking on assets, that type of things. The, 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 the tools are very limited with current arrears. Uh, you know, so ultimately until they hit sort of that two year window, that's when we have more of a, an ability to collect them. So obviously in those other areas, they must have, uh, you, you know, you know, the people are just paying the current arrears more quickly because I, I don't see a lot of tools they're utilizing to get those current arrears paid. Um, you know, in the future, it is something that's on our work plan to sort of look at is there, is there better ways to get to these people sooner uh, so they don't get into that situation? Or, or maybe we talked about it a bit earlier about pri providing more disincentives if they're not paying. So, you know, uh, the tax, the, uh, the interest on taxes is that, you know, we've, we're utilizing the, the provincial maximum. Uh, doesn't seem to be uh, as much of a, enough of a trigger, so maybe there's some other things we can put in place to, uh, uh, to as a more of an impetus for those current taxpayers to pay their taxes. Any questions to Jim? <clears throat> another another good report, Jim. Glad that you uh, took the time to to, to be here and uh, and go through this with us. It uh, it's always nice to have this uh, type of presentation that we can take out on the road and, and bring to the public when uh, when we're asked uh, you know in terms of our wastewater rates why they're so high or not uh, or our taxes as a result did you say of income or uh, in comparison to our peers it's 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 very simple and well done and easy for us to to be able to show that uh, the public that uh, um, you know I think we're overall managing the municipality in a very financial uh, well uh, situation and we're we're making sure that uh, that we're putting enough money away for tomorrow uh, but also ensuring that we're investing properly today and so it's it's, uh, it's a good report and I'm, I, I will be using it uh, I likely will plagiarize some of your words <laughs> and, uh, not where I made the mistake yeah no. <laughs> <laughs> the, so I need a mover and a seconder Thanks. that the presentation material from Jim Brzee's BMA consultant, a memorandum <laughs> FDSM 0120 BMA municipal study uh, results 2019 be received as information. Councillor Medcalf. Seconded Councillor Corbett. All those in favor. That is carried unanimously. Thanks, Jim. And... Uh, yeah, we'll, uh, we have one item to go into camera, and uh, so I need a mover and a second to that pursuant to Section 239 of the Municipal Act Council convened a meeting at 11.43, closed to the public uh, to discuss labor relations or employee negotiations. With respect to HRD 02 2020 uh, UFCW collective agreement negotiations update. All those in favor? Actually, a mover. Oh. Councillor Shurton, seconder. Councillor Lawrence. All those in favor? That is carried unanimously. Woo!